All right. Um, why don't we get started? And um, I, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, welcome to the 2022 Children's Budget Summit. Um, I'm Bruce Leslie. I'm the president of First Focus on Children. Um, since uh, 2008, First Focus has tracked the share of spending allocated to kids across the federal budget. Our children's budget strives to be a resource for all advocates, members of Congress, and, the, and administration officials who are committed to bettering the lives of children. Today, we will hear from the authors of Children's Budget 2022 on the top findings of this year's analysis. We are also very excited to feature a conversation with Director Shalanda Young of the Office of Management and Budget, as well as opening remarks from the Chairman of the Senate Finance Committee and the great champion for children, Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon. We will begin with a review of the results and then move to our keynote with Director Young. I will then share recent um, polling related to government spending on children. For those of you who are registered and are joining by Zoom, we will end with a Q&A with two of our children's budget authors. Throughout the event, please submit your questions using the Q&A portal at the bottom of the webinar screen. Our team will collect these questions throughout and answer them at the end of the event. Closed captioning is also available for those watching through Zoom. You can enable captions at the bottom of your screen. If you are following along online, you can join the conversation on social media with the hashtags um, ha uh, Children's Budget 2022 or a hashtag Investing Kids. I'd like to begin by thanking key members of the Children's Budget team. This project is a large undertaking that requires the dedication of all first focus on children's staff. And specifically, thank you to Michelle Dalfour and Jessica Troy. Olivia Gomez and Michelle Kale for all their work on this year's children's budget. The children's budget, like other first focus on children's projects, would not be possible without the general support of Wellspring Philanthropic Group Fund, I'm sorry, Wellspring Philanthropic Fund, the Oak Foundation, GHR Foundation, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and the Annie Casey Foundation. We appreciate all their support for, for our work. Thank you. Um, and, and also th thanks for, uh, as we work together to create a better world for our children and grandchildren. This year's children's budget is a good story. The overall share of spending for FY 2022 is the highest ever recorded by First Focus on Children. Just as important for the second year in a row, the overall share of spending for children has increased reversing a downward trend experience from um, FY18 uh, to FY2020. Six program areas in particular are experiencing an increase in the share of spending since FY2017. When we look to the future, however, the children's budget analysis finds Congress retreating from its commitment to children. Many of the increases we see in this year's report result from pandemic relief provisions enacted into law. As these temporary provisions and support for children is once again at risk. Thank you for joining today's Children's Budget Summit. The challenges children face cross many issue areas that are all interconnected. It is going to take all of us to ensure that the investments needed for children to succeed are made. We are grateful to be in partnership with all of you as we work to build a better now and a better future for our children. As a reminder, we will be hosting a Q&A with some of the report's authors at the end of today's event for registered viewers. Please use the Q&A feature throughout the webinar to submit a question. And again, if you're following online, um, please use has hashtags Children's Budget 2022 and um, Invest in Kids. I would now like to welcome Senator Ron Wyden to provide his opening remarks. Thank, thank, thanks to the center for joining us today, but more so we thank him for his leadership for children as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. He has been a longstanding champion for children um, in our legislative scorecard. The center has also, has also been a leading force in addressing the children's mental health crisis by bettering supports, access, and funding for children's mental health services. He is a huge supporter of the Medicaid and CHIP programs, um, and also has done in, enormous work in with respect to child welfare. So all those things and more, um, we really appreciate the Senator. He's, he is a true champion for children and we are proud to partner with him in this work. Senator Ron Wyden here, extending a warm welcome to the Children's Budget Summit. 
And I want to thank all of you for your hard work on behalf of America's children. There's no shortage of challenges facing young people today. And I'm very pleased to be able to work with groups like First Focus that spend every day trying to make the lives of young people better. It's no secret that investing in children is just about the most important bet possible. If children are able to grow up in a healthy, safe, and stable environment, they're going to thrive. And our state and country thrive too. As chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, I fought hard to expand affordable health care and extend the boosted child tax credit. We did that to improve the quality of health care for kids, especially when it comes to mental health. And we've been pushing hard on a bipartisan basis to address shortfalls in youth mental health care. Some of our work was included in the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act that passed earlier this year. Obviously, there's so much more to do. America has to live up to the principle that young people should be able to get mental health care where they need it and when they need it. Finally, I especially want to thank Bruce Leslie and everybody at First Focus for their unwavering dedication to bettering the lives of children. Have a good rest of a summit, and thanks for all you're doing, and look forward to partnering with you. Thank you so much, Senator Wyden, and, and also, you know, in addition to all your, his fantastic work on health care policy and child welfare, he's also an uh, enormous um, leader in terms of the child tax credit. And so with that, I definitely, um, I turn it over to my colleague, Jessica. Great, hello everyone. I'm just gonna take a minute to share my screen. There we go. Um, yeah, I'll echo Bruce in thanking Senator Wyden for those remarks. Um, hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the release of the 2022 Children's Budget Book. I'm Jessica Cho, the Senior Director of Budget and Data Analytics at First Focus, and I'll be providing a quick overview of the book and our findings. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before I begin. Um, I know this was answered in the Q&A, but um, we are recording the summit and it will be available on our website immediately. Um, and we will send it around um, to registered attendees. Um, and then as people are doing uh, during the presentation, please put your questions in the Q&A feature and we will answer them at the end. Um, so first we're going to briefly go over what's included in the children's budget book. So the book details the share of spending allocated to children across more than 250 programs in the federal budget. For many programs, like programs in our education and early childhood chapter, we allocate 100% of the funding to children. But for programs, um, but for other programs, we use agency and programmatic data to determine the percentage of funding allocated to children. Uh, the book tracks both domestic and international spending on children and includes both mandatory and discretionary funding streams. Um, the uh, budget book is categorized um, into 11 investment areas. Um, they're all listed here. Most are pretty self-explanatory, um, but I just want to quickly call attention to two specific areas. Children's budget 2022 marks the first time First Focus on Children is devoting an entire chapter to tracking government spending on environmental health. This chapter analyzes federal spending that protects children against the impacts of climate change, air pollution, toxins and pesticides. Um, we also have reorganized our coverage of child welfare and safety. So if you've been following the book for a while, you know that we usually have a child welfare and safety um, chapter. This year, we created um, a justice and child protection chapter that encompasses three systems, youth justice, child welfare, and the unaccompanied children program. We think that this reorganization and renaming just better reflects the goals of these programs. And then I'm just going to quickly walk through um, just a, an example of what a chapter looks like so you can get the information you're looking for. Um, so this is here we have the nutrition chapter um, at the beginning of every chapter you'll see the change in share from 2017 to 2022 this big um, blue number. Um, and then the table below which will include spending levels inflation adjusted changes from the prior year and that year's share so that's this. Um, this table right here. And, um, and then at the end of every chapter, um, every single program that we include in that um, chapter will, will be listed in their, in their funding information for each. 
Um, so now we'll get into um, the findings. Um, so Children's Budget 2022 finds that the share of US domestic international spending on children rose 21% over the last five years, making up 11.98% of all federal spending in FY 2022. Um, so we have 11.88% up for domestic and then 0.1% um, for international. This share stands in stark contrast to 2020 investments when the total share of federal spending on children was only 7.55% of the federal budget these here. Um, so the difference between now and 2020 has been game changing for children. For example, the investment by the American Rescue Plan Act and the child tax credit resulted in a drop in child poverty measures during the global pandemic and uh, um, economic recession. The American Rescue Plan also added funding to combat child hunger, provided funding to keep childcare centers from closure and helped our nation's schools to reopen with improvements to health and safety protections. Um, I just want to quickly note, I think you'll see these red bars that um, are, are decreases in the domestic uh, and the combined graphs. Um, the decrease in the Biden 2023 results largely because the president's 2023 budget request recommends a deficit neutral reserve fund uh, to indicate the investment support for its Build Back Better agenda. Um, but it didn't propose specific funding levels, um, so we were not able to include estimated spending for those policy investment priorities in our analysis. Um, so now I just want to go through some additional bright spots in the budget book. Um, so since 2017, the share of federal spending going to federal domestic spending on children increased by nearly 22% from FY 2017 to FY 22, really bolstered by the remnants of pandemic spending. Um, education programs increased by 105%, uh, largely due to the Emergency Connectivity Fund uh, and the Education Stabilization Fund. Um, children's environmental health increased by 25%. Uh, children's income support programs increased by 21%, largely due to increases in the child tax credit at the beginning of FY22. Um, the justice and child protection programs increased by 28%. Um, these, this increase mainly due to uh, increases in the unaccompanied children's program and the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. Um, children's, nutrition, oops, excuse me, children's nutrition programs increased by 36%, mainly due to the continuation of pandemic EBT. And child safety increased by 21%, largely due to the increase in the Stop School Violence Act. So this, this is all great news, <laughs> but uh, there are some warning signs um, in, in our analysis. So while we're still reaping the benefits of increased funding in response to the pandemic, lawmakers are currently paring back those investments are on track to reverse the progress made um, in, in key areas like investments in child poverty reduction and declining food and, um, and food programs that have resulted in declining food insufficiency. So if, for example, funding and inflation adjusted dollars dropped over 17% between FY21 and FY22 for domestic spending. Um, the other warning sign is that much of the emergency pandemic funding has since expired. Um, we've got some remnants, as I mentioned before, continuing in FY22, but those, when we look forward to FY23, will, will expire, um, indicating that, that Congress really offered little more than temporary solutions to long-term challenges children and families face. Um, a great example of that. So discretionary spending had a, a huge increase last year, but from year to year experienced a nearly 30% decline in inflation adjusted dollars between FY21 and FY22. Um, as for international funding for kids, um, you know, global crises, including the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, uh, continue to up upend the lives of children and youth around the world making it harder than ever for them to thrive and reach their full potential. In under-resourced parts of the world, this confluence of challenges is undermining decades of progress to improve children's health and well-being. Yet children and young people internationally receive a minimal share of foreign assistance funding, just about eight and a half cents for every dollar spent. Um, I wanna really point out quickly that although this share is slightly higher than, than FY21, the direct accounts that benefit children like maternal and child health, nutrition, tuberculosis, and vulnerable children accounts actually saw decreases. So without additional investments, 
we're on track to return to the status quo of children's funding. And despite lots of recent improvements from increased investment in, uh, for kids in terms of funding and outcomes, the kids are still not all right. At the end of September 2022, nearly 5 million children lived in a household that couldn't afford to give them enough food. The expanded and fully refundable um, child tax credit was a game changer for children, but since the improved CTC expired in January 2022, we have seen ch child poverty spike, plunging nearly 4 million children back into poverty that month, including over 1.3 million Hispanic children and over 660,000 Black children. Lawmakers currently have the opportunity to enact provisions from the American Families Plan that would provide additional investment for children's needs. With such legislative action, our analyses next year might show a different result for FY23 than we're anticipating. But if Congress fails to act on critical policy issues and budgetary decisions of importance to children, we will see rising rates of child poverty, increasing numbers of uninsured children, more children left hungry and homeless, and an increase in the number of kids living in high stress and under-resourced house, households, which can lead to higher levels of child abuse, both at home and abroad. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in today. I've included my email on this slide. Um, I'll be sure to put it in the chat as well. Um, feel free to reach out if you have questions or comments or just to chat about the budget book. I could chat about the budget book all day. Um, and I will now turn it over for a conversation with OMB Director Shalanda Young. Well, I just wanted to welcome you, um, Director Shalanda Young. Uh, we um, are so excited to have you uh, to talk to us today, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us about our children's budget book, and um, also to you know the audience here at our children's budget summit. So thank you for thank joining you for having us. me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things we we really um, a quote we use often at First Focus on children is. Um, President Biden's quote on, you know, don't tell, tell me what you value, show me your, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. And so one of the things, you know, we just want to thank you all so much on is that um, we've been tracking the share of spending um, since 2006 on children. And um, when you all entered office, um, we were at all time low. So in 2020, the share was 7.55. And as you know, in today's book release, um, we're, we're showing that the share has gone up to 11.9. And so, and that is due in large part to all the great work of the Biden administration and certainly our champions for children in Congress. Um, so knowing these, these numbers, what is your reaction and what messages does the, the budget of the administration um, communicate to children and families? So thank you, Bruce. Again, thank you for having me. This is a pleasure for me to do. Uh, you just gave me a tidbit of information. One of our senior leadership team also worked at First Focus on the first children's budget book. So we're yes. happy to have uh, Michael Linden in our family. He was in your family before. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, you're speaking to a new parent. I don't know if you knew this, yeah, but I have yeah. uh, an almost 11 month oh, old. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so not to say that, thank you so much. So not to say that these things don't matter to you before you become a parent. Yep. Um, but there is a switch people tell you you have uh, that you don't quite believe until yeah. she's like here. It happens the second she's here. Um, and so I, I can't read a story about children uh, hurting or see children in pain or, or without enough, uh, without really uh, my heart falling out of my chest. So these things mean so much to me personally. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to to do this event and uh, speak about uh, Joe Biden's uh, budget and his investment in children. Uh, look, it's not just the it's it's not just the the numbers you see go up. It's just intrinsic into who he is as a president, uh, as a man. You know, he yeah. he is a, a father first. Um, so it's not hard to do a budget for someone like that. There's no convincing it takes to to put investments uh, in for uh, our most vulnerable, our children. Uh, so you absolutely see increases um, in Title I education. You absolutely uh, see increases in Pell Grants. You've seen, uh, you know, what the president has done and Head Start and yeah. um, our proposals we put out there. We haven't gotten everything, but uh, part of what we do here is push the envelope. If we don't ask, uh, at least it starts the conversation. No, and we, we very much appreciate it. I mean, it's, it's, it's unprecedented, is basically from our perspective um, of the investments, the recommendations you all have made. 
Um, and, and I'll note that, you know, the Census Bureau last week, and I know you know this, um, also found that um, child poverty had dropped to an all-time low. And that is in large part due to the investments made in um, uh, the pre president's uh, American Rescue Plan um, through like the child tax credit, but also other things, mm -hmm. right, that, you know, that, that you mentioned in terms of things like, you know, child nutrition and housing, like the whole array of things, um, education. Um, and so um, the president also, we know, supported it, the ex extension of the CTC, but unfortunately the Senate let it expire. And so one of the, I guess the question we have is how does the administration plan to um, continue supporting um, policy improvements for kids in light of that and, 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 and issues that are sort of game changing for yeah. children like that. I mean, that, that's a huge thing and we're, you know, we, we appreciate your, your continued support. And um, so what other things can we, are, are, can we expect yeah. on the horizon, I guess? Well, just like you, Bruce, I think you spent some years um, on the Senate side, right. me, me on the House. Um, right. You know, these things, I like to say they're a marathon, not a sprint. I remind my team of that uh, all the time. It can be very frustrating, the process, yeah. um, you know, but these big things, they're big things we're trying to do. They take time. Um, so some things we got a yes on. Um, people who work on it don't feel like they were in quick order. Yeah. Uh, but the things we did and we keep going, we keep pushing. We Anyone who's willing to work with us, um, versions of child tax credit have bipartisan champions. Yep. That to me is a great sign. So we keep pushing, we keep talking, we keep uh, proposing. Uh, and we don't give up. And you're absolutely right. The levels of child poverty came down. Uh, so the, the case was made through that. Um, and so we, we will continue to find partners uh, and not, not let up. Uh, Joe Biden's still the president. So we have some time. Uh, and in this town, you know, patience uh, pays off. These aren't new ideas. Yeah. I'm sure you uh, and others have worked on these a long time before CTC was even adopted in the American Rescue Plan. Yeah. So I, I'm not giving up. Um, awesome. And it takes, you know, a continued focus and continued discussion around uh, those things. We have lots to do. Uh, and let's not forget, uh, if it wasn't for young people, we wouldn't have the climate pieces we got uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act. Right. So not only are uh, my hope is they're beneficiaries because it helps us meet our climate targets, it was because of them, their activism, uh, that spurred uh, lawmakers in this town to do the right thing on climate. So I, I have a little bit of optimism That's here. Good. That's good. One, well, we really appreciate you know the partnership we've had with you all on on the, on these really important kids issues, and I really you know can't thank you enough for for the the investments you are committed to in these areas. Um, and so with respect to the FY23 proposal. Um, you know, we've been talking about sort of, you know, investments in kids and how money matters. Mm -hmm. And so um, what kinds of things do, you know, can we expect in the president's budget? And, um, and what is your strategy for ensuring that children and families come out ahead as part of the annual appropriations process in, yeah. the, in the coming year? So um, you probably know this, but I spent most of my professional adult career um, at some job or another with the appropriations committee. So uh, you will find no bigger advocate and reminder of people. We had some big wins over the last couple of years um, in the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure uh, Act, Science and Chips. But please don't forget the appropriations laws. We had huge wins yeah. uh, just this March in, in the uh, annual appropriations bills. And some of it goes unnoticed. Um, but that's where when people hear about Head Start, our basic child care block grant is funded in the appropriations bills. Uh, Title I, we proposed uh, vast amounts of spending. We didn't get everything we asked for, but we got a billion dollar increase in Title I, yeah. the largest we've seen in decades. So you cannot uh, forget the appropriations process because yeah. a key foundational basis for how we, um, how we approach programs, especially with children and families. So um, it is it's kind of my bread and butter, what I spent my career on. And I, I spent a lot of time reminding people, hey, <laughs> you know, not the 10 year sources of money you get, you know, and some of the uh, the the bigger packages we've been talking about. But those uh, annual bills, uh, they're hard to hard to get. They're hard fought. Uh, but it gives us a chance every year to to build on a lot of these programs that mean a, a lot to people. 
Uh, and one thing you started with about how Joe Biden talks about a budget, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget, I'll tell you what you value. Yeah. Uh, remember Joe Biden also says, this economy, this country is best when we grow it, grow the economy from the bottom up and middle out. Uh, people hear that, they think it's a throwaway line. It is his economic vision uh, for the country. And you cannot have that vision without thinking about children, future generations, uh, and families with children. So everything we do is modeled around that, including through the annual appropriations process. Yeah, and I, th I, think, I think your point on the appropriations process is a huge one particularly in our community, because kids disproportionately are in the appropriations budget mm -hmm. and not in mandatory, right? And so you're absolutely right. That's that's a, an issue we stress all the time and, and, and really important. Um, so we talked a little bit about that we started the Children's Budget Book in 2006 with, yeah. with Michael Linden. Um, but, you know, and we do it because it's a comprehensive look at all the programs. I think there's um, in our sector, in the children's sector, there's, you know, people are very siloed and they don't necessarily mm -hmm. see the big picture. Um, and so it does provide that sort of comprehensive thing and also a baseline. Um, and so, um, you know, we also, we also find that it's, it's a good resource to, um, to the Hill and to even to the administration. Yeah. Um, so in light of that, um, you know, why, do, why, why is it important for us for, to track these, these, you know, these, the share of spending and um, all the different appropriations line items and things like that, like, you know, that res that's respect to children and how can the administration use the information mm -hmm. um, and what, what things could maybe we even do better to help, you know, yep. to help you. So one, uh, you're absolutely, if you don't know, you don't know wh wh where you're trying to accomplish. So that set of data helps us with, have a starting point so we can build from that. Um, and you talk about people, you know, in this town, they work on one thing or another. Yeah. It's hard to see a comprehensive, um, I would say children's budget is a great example of that. Uh, what we spend on children in this country is that, uh, you know, I think your your book is probably the first comprehensive thing I saw. So thank you and your organization for doing that because it really does draw focus to something. I don't think you find any member of Congress, anyone in the administration who says they don't support uh, children's programs, but when you see it all in one place and what you, w what it means to to support it, mm -hmm. then these are the programs. Um, it really brings it home. So, uh, just like I mentioned with young people and uh, the the activism that brought it around climate change, um, truly believe it made a difference. These things like the children's book really brings it home for uh, policymakers and administration on the Hill. Because uh, they, they, you know, this is something I, that has bipartisan support, um, but often uh, you, you say these things in a vacuum, the budget book, having it in one place uh, really does give people specifics, concrete things uh, that they can do uh, to put their money where their mouth is, basically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, uh, one of the things we started a couple of years ago is we also add the international. So it's mm -hmm. we do all the domestic and international. And so... It really does. We really are trying to capture that. And so, yeah, any, if you ever have, you know, if you all have input that there's things we need to change or, or add to. We so have you, to you're looking at a former staffer for uh, Nita Lowy, who yeah. um, was a big advocate of international, yeah. um, ever, international everything, but specifically education for young uh, women and girls. And uh, one of the great things we were able to name uh, basic education uh, at State Department after uh -huh. after her before yeah. she retired. So um, it is absolutely something near and dear to my heart because I uh, saw what a difference uh, small amounts of money make um, overseas, uh, especially bringing women and girls into the fold, into the economy. Like we we forget um, we forget that sometimes because we made such strides, but in other places, women and girls are not. Uh, fully participatory in society and that basic education money uh, to, to bring them into classrooms really does make a difference. Yeah, I think that's very key. Um, so we talked about the numbers, why money and investments matter to children. Um, and these numbers, you know, as you know, have real world impact, um, in, you know, both here and abroad. Um, so one of the things, you know, you know, giving, give us an example of, you um, how the president's budget might improve the lives of kids in something like child welfare, for yeah. example. Yeah. So 
So one, I'm proud of what we've done in child welfare um, specifically. Uh, the president put forward a $10 billion proposal um, to bring about child welfare reforms in this country uh, to keep people out of the foster system. And that's our first goal, right? Um, yeah. To keep families together. Uh, but if we can't, what we found is children do best with people they know. Uh, someone whose grandmother uh, was uh, was consequential in my upbringing. Uh, I know this firsthand. Um, so whenever we can do as a country to keep families together, keep kids with people they know, um, that's what we should be doing. So we have big investments uh, to make sure our foster care system works better. Um, and before we even need to use that system to try and do our best to keep families uh, together. So I, it's something I'm extremely proud about. We, we need to continue to work with Congress. Uh, one of those things that uh, you don't just propose, you got to propose and, and keep convincing, <laughs> keep working, keep talking, keep uh, pounding the pavement. But it's something uh, that really could be a, a game changer. Um, I don't think there's anyone who uh, would say that reform is needed. So we're, we're really proud of the things we put forward. And we also um, put major investments, a 70% increase for the Chafee program um, mm -hmm. that helps um, children who are about to age out of the foster system uh, really get some more support around them as they enter into adulthood a, a lot earlier um, than my child will probably have to no. go into the world. And um, so uh, it's very important that we get them uh, at all ages, but especially a, a hard time, an easy time for people to fall through the cracks is when they're about to age out. Yeah. And that's a good example. And I, you know, I, I think also just to, to really applaud and thank you guys, because um, in many administrations, they'll do an, an initiative in one area, you know, um, but then defund other areas. Yeah. And so the net gain to kids is, you know, maybe even a loss, right? But um, this is a good example of something you guys did, but then also these all these other areas. And so we really appreciate that you guys really captured the whole child in the budget and also want to thank you and all your staff here at OMB for um, always being open to talking to us. We really appreciate that and, and just how great everybody and receptive people have been. Well, you know, I'm, with, glad, you know. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, if I can, the one thing that's really struck me, the reason I think we've been able to uh, do investments in a, in a lot of different places and, um, you know, sometimes it sounds like a non sequitur, but when we talk about people paying their fair share of taxes in this country, the yeah. wealthiest corporations, uh, something we started in, in the Inflation Reduction Act with having mm -hmm. uh, the largest companies pay uh, a minimum tax, that gives us the fiscal space to do things for children. Yeah. Um, so we don't have to. We can actually bring down the deficit while investing. Um, so all these things are interrelated. Um, and that is a, a key thing I've learned from the president. Uh, we pay uh, because we are not only bringing fairness into a tax system, it's not always fair, but guess what? If we do that, we can uh, not pull back, but actually invest, um, especially with our most critical population and children. So um, it's a very good, uh, he has a, a, a clear goal and a, a values um, and everything we do revolves around that, but it gives us the room to make these investments. Yeah, and, and just in closing, I you know we started off with the president's quote on look at, yeah. look at the budget and what you value, and we can affirmatively say that you guys are have valued kids, and we really appreciate it. So well, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, thank you for for uh, having us and and uh, well for coming and talking <laughs> to us, and uh, we appreciate and look forward to working with you in the future. So thank Thanks, you. Bruce. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, uh, Director Young really was very articulate and well-versed on all the issues uh, of importance for kids. For some of you in the chat, I know people were directing some questions to her. This was, we taped that um, a, a little while ago and it was actually on a really hot day. So I apologize, I was, I was definitely overheated, but she was awesome and they really have been great partners. So we really appreciate that. Um, I want to, at this time then, um, Kind of talk a little bit more about um, the budget book and um, let's see. Let's see why is this not jumping? There we go. So just talk talk a little bit uh, to add on to what what Jessica talked about earlier. So first of all, 
you know, the children really do, as Jessica noted in her presentation, we, they really do need us to be ambitious. And I want to talk about three things here uh, to follow up on the numbers, which is one is it is very clear that money matters. Investing in kids does pay dividends. Um, that champions for children uh, matter and made a huge difference in sort of the change we saw in the reversal of the decline in spending that we were seeing for kids and and how we've now seen a, 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 some a, a very remarkable increase in the last two years, but you know definitely threats on the horizon. And then last, I um, want to talk about some polling that shows that the, the American people uh, strongly support children and making investments in kids. Um, so first of all, we know, uh, everyone on this call knows that money matters and the evidence is strong. And um, there's report after report um, that talk about that and, and really show that there's enormous return on investment um, when you, when, in kids. And that um, as a nation, the, the Hillary Hoynes and uh, piece is, for example, really does show that we are really underfunding and, make, and not making full investments in our kids. Um, this quote from Michael Freeman, I think a lot of us really uh, in the kids community can really relate to. And it's sort of this point that kids are often ignored, dismissed, or diminished. And that very rarely do, do people pay attention to um, kids when they're making policies and that kids are often treated as an afterthought. Um, it's important to note that the state of children pre-pandemic was, was not great. Um, we ranked uh, a fantastic UNICEF report highlighted the U.S. ranked 36 out of 38 wealthy nations on dozens of well-being measures. Um, and then also the, the um, Coins and, and uh, a Schatzenbach uh, article that I just mentioned uh, really showed that the United States is near the bottom of countries belonging in, to the OECD in family benefit, public spending as a share of GDP. So we really, we, uh, it's the combination of we don't invest and so therefore we have poor outcomes for kids. Um, Jessica talked about this, but I think it's important to highlight again is this, this relationship. So. Uh, of how money does matter. In, in between 2017 and 2020, the share of spending for kids actually dropped, declined by 24%. And that's a remarkable uh, decrease over the, that period of time. And what we saw, what we were witnessing was rising uninsured rates, child suicide rates, higher infant mortality, child mortality, higher levels of child poverty, uh, rising child abuse rates, increasing child homelessness, and rising child hunger um, as we enter 2020. Um, and, and again, that was, you know, pre-pandemic. Um, um, but one of the things that that did happen is I think initially we, we all saw that uh, people looked to kids and thought that they were pretty, they were not, they were not harmed by the, the pandemic. And I think one of the great, the things the child advocacy community did a great job of was really explain to the public and to policymakers that that was not true. Actually, every aspect of the lives of kids was being negatively impacted. And you saw the investment then that, that followed. And so, for example, the new child tax credit um, lifted millions of kids out of poverty. And also people recognized the, the challenges kids were facing with Children's Mental Health Center widened. Talked about that, so did Director Young. So people really did understand it. And I think that the child advocacy community deserves a lot of credit in that um, there was investments made in things like childcare, uh, child nutrition, um, homelessness. So across the board, there were there was lots of things happen in child health. Um, there was definitely investments made in, in mental health, but also in making sure that kids um, got healthcare coverage. Um, we, we had seen a four year decline in the insured rate among children after two decades of progress, we were, we were heading backwards and um, Congress did a number of things and so did the administration that really made sure that we actually increased coverage for kids. We actually saw last year a more than double digit increase in, in uh, or decrease in the uninsured rate of kids actually. Um, so in addition to the fact that money matters, the other thing point I think we need to make here is that uh, champions for children matter. Um, so, um, this is a picture of our of the people who really were instrumental in getting the 
child tax credit passed, which was a, an enormous uh, investment in kids that were, was made. And so what you see here is, is that um, the, you know, the, the senators and, and members of Congress who were very instrumental in that. In addition to that, of course, um, Senator, you know, Chairman Wyden um, played a huge role in that and also Chairman Neal um, to really make the, the get the child tax credit passed and had an enormous impact on cutting child poverty. And again, as Jessica noted, unfortunately it has expired. And so while we continue to advocate for getting it extended, um, kids are beginning to fall back into poverty because of its expiration and families are actually seeing a tax increase because of that. Um, I just wanna make a quick shout out to our uh, sister organization, First Focus Campaign for Children. They do, it, we do a, uh, a scorecard annually, and uh, we 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 score all the different bills, both domestically and internationally, um, that are of importance to kids. And there's there's definitely some work we still need to do. We need more champions. Um, but one of the things I think is important to note is uh, women in Congress are still more than two times more likely to be uh, champions than men. And then there's also very profound regional differences. And so we definitely need to work on. Um, increasing the number of champions in the Southeast and the Southwest. Um, and, and it should be noted that those are the areas in the country where actually kids are faring the worst. If you look at the Annie Casey Kids Count data book, um, the Southeast and Southwest have the worst um, outcomes for kids. Um, so back to what the good news story was, the American Rescue Plan um, really helped cut child poverty and did so much more. And it did things across a variety of areas that, that I already mentioned um, that, that really had a, a profound impact on kids. Um, the child tax credit alone resulted in, 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 according to the Census Bureau, in at least in around 3 million kids um, basically being lifted out of poverty. Um, so that, that was a huge impact um, from the uh, ARPA or the American Rescue Plan. Um, and as Jessica noted, the differences between 2020 and 22 were game changing for kids. And you can see the, the, the very uh, stark change in, in the investments in domestic child funding. I will note though, however, that on the international side, we still have a penance and a short changing of children that we need to continue to work very hard on at the very same time that we're now, as Jessica talked about, we have warning signs on the horizon for kids. So on the international scale, I just wanted to highlight this again. We, uh, we are still well below even 2017 levels. Um, and this is at a time when, you know, over 10, 10 million kids worldwide lost a parent or caregiver because of COVID. And so those kids are facing profound challenges and, and there is not a systemic effort to address them. In addition to, we're seeing reductions in immunization rates, um, kids being displaced because of wars and famine and all kinds of things, including uh, uh, climate change. So it is definitely an area that needs much more attention and investment. Um, and so what, where we stand right now is sort of kids are standing at a crossroads and there's the threats of what we talked about of the expiration of the American Rescue Plan provisions like the child tax credit and child care and those kinds of things. Um, there's also the end of the COVID funding. Um, I think it's important to highlight that uh, the immunizations that came apart as part of that funding for adults um, happened. And um, now that kids are really online to get uh, their vaccinations, now the COVID funding is ending. So right at the time that we were trying to get kids va vaccinated, COVID fundings ended and Congress is not extending them at this point. So that is you know, kids are being disproportionately impacted there in a negative way. And we also have, uh, we did a, a report with um, Unidos US and Families USA that really highlights the, if when the public health emergency uh, ends, um, lots of kids who are enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP, millions of kids could lose healthcare coverage. And so there's lots of things that we need to do to address, um, to make sure that children we don't have, see a, a rise in the number of uninsured kids. And last, on the point of being ambitious, a return to normal uh, with respect to the budget is, is definitely not ambitious. And, and we're very concerned about that trend. Um, and, and I'm not gonna talk much about this today, but another threat on the horizon is certainly the parental rights movement and 
um, happy to have that conversation with people and we're, you know, to know we are hoping to put together a summit with other kid groups. And so if you're interested, um, we'd love to have a conversation about what to do about that threat. Um, I also wanna give a shout out real quick to our partners at the Urban Institute. They just released a companion report or a report that we, you know, we, we also look to and, and would like to highlight, which is um, their KidShare report. And as their report shows here, um, a return to normal means divesting in kids. And so you can see the, the huge drop in uh, assistance to kids through the tax code, whether it's the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, or the child independent care credit, so the CDCTC. Um, you also seen drops in nutrition funding and then a huge drop in education and child care. So these are, these are threats on the horizon for kids unless Congress takes action to restore some of those fundings. We're seeing a huge cliff effect that is very clear in this chart from the Urban Institute. Um, we're also seeing, you know, we've talked about some of these things, but the, uh, the absence of the child tax credit is leading to more kids falling into poverty. We're seeing a sharp decline in childhood vac vaccinations right at the very time that the, the, uh, the COVID funding has is, is gone away. And child hunger is now once again on the rise. And, and then last I mentioned the report that we talked about with respect to the threat of, of on, with respect to children's health. Um, last, I just want to talk a little bit about some polling that really shows the American people are with us and really do strongly support making investments in kids. And so this is a poll conducted by Lake Research Partners. And what it shows is that, you know, our point that uh, kids are often treated as an afterthought and dismissed by policymakers. You can see overwhelmingly the American public agree. They agree with respect, you know, regardless of age, um, race, party identification across the board uh, by 71, 17% margin, voters agree that kids are often treated as an afterthought. And by an 82 to 13% margin, voters believe that we need to give children greater attention and coordination across all our federal, state, and local programs. Um, voters also think that um, we are spending too little when it comes to kids. So. This is a, a question that, that we asked was, do you think we're spending too much or too little or about right on, on kids? And you can see by wide margins, people, uh, the American public think that we are spending too little as opposed to too much um, on children. And so uh, on, on just about any issue area here, and you can see, for example, like child hunger, um, 64 to five. So that's a, you know, that's a 13 to one margin there that, that the American people believe we're spending too little as opposed to too much on kids. But again, across all issue areas, um, you can see, for example, uh, early childhood and childcare, you know, big margins, and then on healthcare policies, um, but then also on the issue of reducing child poverty by more than six to one, almost seven to one margin, people believe we should be investing more to do that. Um, there's also powerful language to communicate about investing in or helping children. And these were, we asked people if these, uh, if people agree with these messages and people did, you know, by uh, nine in 10 people across the board believed that investing kid is a good investment in children and grandchildren, that it improves their lives, development and outcomes. And that it's also very important for a return on a healthy society and healthy economy. So, and again, this was regardless of age, race, or party identification, and also, um, you know, with between parents and non-parents. Um, we also asked, do you think that we should be making the children's health insurance program permanent? And by, you know, almost eight out of 10 uh, people said that that should happen and they favored that. And they also strongly favored that. We also asked a residence question, like how much do you favor that? And it was very strong. Um, we also asked people even a question about creating something like an independent commissioner for children that other nations have to help investigate or make recommendations on protecting and improving the care and well-being of children. We're seeing all kinds of crises in the troubled teen industry, but also um, other scandals that have involved kids, including, you know, for example, the U.S. Uh, women's gymnastics team and Boy Scouts and other areas that uh, we are not protecting our kids, and, and, and in some cases, institutions 
choose to cover up rather than protect kids. And so the idea of having independent children's commissioner is something the American public does support. Um, we also ask questions about, do you believe that all policy uh, involving kids should be uh, governed by a best interest of the child standard or should be governed by a standard uh, that makes child well-being the first priority? And you can see, you know, you know, by you know, more than eight to one margin, actually nine to one margins, um, the American people um, definitely support that as well. So last, I just want to talk about the child tax credit and child poverty. We asked the question, do, do people support extending the child tax credit, which is something the House did, but the Senate did not do. Um, and you can see by a wide margin, 72 to 21, people favor extending the child tax credit, and they do not like the idea of more children falling into poverty. Um, with respect to the question about poverty on messages, do you think it's, you know, it is, it is it concerning that child poverty is much higher than adult poverty, or the idea that child poverty is a good investment, that, that um, current poverty levels are actually costing society by over a trillion dollars a year. In both cases, American people express strong concern about those things and, and you know, favor making greater investments in cutting child poverty in this country. Um, last, I just wanna say that this support for a children and families agenda is clear and strong with the public. And they do not support this, some of the ideas in the parental rights agenda that includes things like book bans. As you can see, over 80% of people do not support the idea of book bans and censorship that we're seeing in schools all across this country. Um, and I leave you all with this quote from Franklin Roosevelt, which I think is very um, appropriate for this time is that we may not be able to prepare the future for our children, but we can at least prepare our children for the future. And so with that, I want to, um, I will end this segment and uh, definitely want to bring in Michelle and Jessica to talk about, um, to answer any questions people have um, with respect to the budget book um, and any aspects of it. I, I see we've already got some questions um, in the Q&A, but, um, let me just start with this one is um let me let me you know oh, sorry sorry bruce yeah. um before we begin the, the q a um we're we're just gonna be it's gonna be zoom so we're gonna um i just want to thank thank everyone for tuning in on youtube or social media um the q a will only be available for registered participants in zoom um, but we encourage everyone to continue the conversation online using the hashtag hashtag children's budget 2022 and hashtag invest in kids um, and be sure to check out the full report, which is now live on our website at firstfocus.org. Awesome. Uh, Chairman Wyden and OMB Director uh, Young. Um, so with that, um, 